Welcome everybody um, to the second series of the prescribing safety assessment. Um, so I'm Janice, one of the, the leads for the final year series, and I'm very happy to say that we have Dr. Aisha Ahmed, who's duly trained in pharmacy and medicine. So we're I'm an F1 and she's an F2. So really welcome her to join us for today. So um, very excited to be partnered with Wesleyan, which is a company that helps foundation doctors um, to prepare you for a career, your finances and well-being. So check their website out by scanning this code. And we also encourage everybody to apply for um, the F1 membership under the Medical Defense Union and you get a free gift and also you get a lot of medical legal advice via their website. So an introduction of our team, um, this is me, and we have Salmia and Bellamrit who are leads for the Kill Medical Education Society. So they, they really help us a lot behind the scenes. Um, and then of course we have Dr. Dosa, which is the founder of Mind the Bleep. We have um, Dr. Sona Petrosian. So the whole PSA series is designed by her and monitored by her because she's also duly trained in pharmacy and medicine. Um, so, if I go to the next one, the just uh, a disclaimer. So the P PSA series for Mind the Bleep has been created by us, the junior doctors, with our passion in teaching completely on a voluntary basis. Uh, the slides and teaching content are accurate to the best of our knowledge, and neither the tutors or Mind the Bleep take responsibility for any unintentional inaccuracies. And please refer to the Mind the Bleep website for more information on this. So this is the our schedule and today we'll be covering elderly care prescribing and pediatrics and next week it will be on adverse drug reactions. Okay, this is the blueprint. Right, the structure is we'll give you some tips on general revision and this would be taught by Dr. Ahmed. Um, and then we'll I will cover elderly care medicine with some questions. So get your paper and BNF ready. And then the second half will be covered by Dr. Ahmed on pediatrics prescribing. So without further ado, I'll let Dr. Ahmed um, introduce. Thanks, Janice. Um, so here's just a few tips just for you to get ready um, while you're revising for your PSA. Um, do make sure you play around with the BNF. Uh, that's via the NICE website or Medicines Complete, depending on which one you like. I personally like um, the NICE website. I don't know what Janice or Sona's preferences are, but I find the interface a lot easier on the NICE website. Um, and remember to practice typing in the actual drug names into the um, search button. So the top point here on the slide says put in the generic name. So for example, if you put Tazacin in, which is the brand name, you may not find the drug that you're looking for in the monograph so therefore you should write the actual full drug name same with um let me think like calpol type in paracetamol um and then when you want to practice prescribing um bring up any practice test papers and then tr uh, try typing the drug name in and see what comes up if you have any ideas of common types of drugs um so just keep typing different drugs and reading the monographs and the more drugs you kind of read also makes you more familiar to the bnf so when it comes to the exam you know exactly which section of the monograph you're going to be looking at in the exam and remember, each monograph of the drug talks about the indications, the side effects. So if you just kind of get yourself used to the layout of the websites or even the paper copy. Um, so just keep practicing with the websites. Um, and also they have a great little section on the BNF where you could type in the little drugs names and it can work out what interactions um, there are. So just practice that. So just start, start throwing some drug names into the um, interaction section and yeah, just get familiar with that because in the exam, it's, you have be quite quick um, as yeah time is not on your side and um, as Janice will explain um, further on get a paper BNF if you can they are quite pricey so just walk into your local pharmacist honestly if they they'll have a few copies your community pharmacy just pop in say if you've got a BNF um, they I'm pretty sure will be willing to give you some or if you are on placement uh, befriend the pharmacist there they have so many BNFs copies in their pharmacy dispensary and they might be willing to give you one so yeah do try to get yourself a paper copy okay so we'll start with um prescribing in elderly care so the first question you will have um one minute and a half for this one
Okay, so that's roughly one and a half minutes. Um, feel free to put your answers in the chat as we go through the question. So this question is essentially asking you to prescribe a laxative for an 85 year old patient who had just had surgery and with particular focus that she only she's only using pain relief like paracetamol. So we'll cover why this is important information. And she doesn't want anything that's via the rectal route. She wants something oral. So if we look at the answer. So if you picked Senna or Bisacodial, um, both of this would be accepted. And um, for Senna, it will be an oral tablet that you give at night, um, 15 milligrams. For Bisacodial, it will be five milligrams as well and tablet at night. And I'll go through um, different types of laxatives and why they're not as suitable as these ones here. So both of these are stimulant um, laxatives. So essentially they activate the bowel so it moves and pushes the pull out via the rectum. Um, but you want to be aware of using that in someone with bowel obstruction because that might cause perforation. And I see um, a colleague um, mentioning macrogol. 3,352 sachets. So normally this is what you see on the ward because this is one of the um, osmotic um, laxative. It also tastes very nice, I've tasted it before, but however, it's not as um, recommended here because the patient in the stem, it says that she's feeling very bloated. So you don't, it, the one of the side effects of macrogol is actually causes the patient feeling more bloated. Um, and so the reason, so that's why I put this water sign next to osmotic, just to help us to remember. And going down the line, if you've put docusate, um, unfortunately, it's not as suitable as Senna or Bisacodio because the, the stem also said that the patient's stool is actually very soft. So giving them a softener for the stool is not as effective. Whereas if the patient has very hard stool, then this would definitely be recommended. And last but not least, we have a bulking agent called Ispa husk and normally this is um this is first line according to our hospital um experience but it's not as suitable because it's usually for patients who don't eat enough fiber in their diet and it takes up to 72 hours to work for this patient who had three days of no bowel opening this is not suitable hence the most suitable options in this case is Senna and bisacodial um, for a revision go to um, constipation as one of the treatment summary to help you revise the different types of laxatives and um, you should this should cover your basis. So next question. Oh, sorry. Before the next question, um, I, I mentioned that the patient was using paracetamol, but if the stem said the patient is actually using morphine, the general approach would be to give them an osmotic laxative, as one of your colleagues mentioned, a macrogol and a stumen, and so either Senna and bisacodial. So you normally see Senna and macrogol prescribed on the ward. And there are also treatment summaries in the BNF for um, constipation and palliative care, pregnancy and breastfeeding and children. So it's also good revision um, material before your PSA. So next question, um, you will have one minute for this one.
Okay, so one minute is up. Um, feel free to put your answers as we go through the question. So this question is asking you to prescribe some painkillers for a 72-year-old woman who has presented to her GP with a short history of shivering and myalgia with some burning pain and numbness of the skin on the left side of her chest. So um, she also had a rash and just going through the past medical history, she has IBD, um, hip replacement, does not seem to be related to the rash in this case. So you want to prescribe some pain relief. So what did people put in general? So um, amitriptyline, someone suggests gabapentin. So this is actually taken from the official paper. And while it does sound like a neuropathic pain, the actual answer is actually paracetamol. So I'll go through why. So for amitriptyline, it's a tricyclic antidepressant, um, as, as it might suggest, it could sound like a neuropathic pain. However, the history specif specified that it's only for a few days. So it's not like a long-term thing. Whereas if you have someone with trigeminal neuralgia, then you would definitely think about carbamazepine and other types of uh, painkillers. So another option was ibuprofen, normally recommended for musculoskeletal pain, so not related in this case. Gabapentin is um, very commonly prescribed for neuropathic pain in diabetes, in diabetic neuropathy, because it works as a muscle relaxant. So it's very common in the PSA when they ask you to prescribe something for someone with type 2 diabetes with um, pins and needles in their lower limbs, and this is when you think about gabapentin. Cocodamol, um, so normally with the pain letter, we go with the very bottom. So the very bottom is either you do nothing like a conservative or you start low like with paracetamol. If paracetamol is not working, then you add on the opioid. So cocodamol wouldn't be indicated in the first place. So um, hopefully this makes sense for everybody. So we'll move on to the next one. Before we move on to the next question, I made this slide because I think pain often comes up in the PSA. And as mentioned, for musculoskeletal pain, um, for back pain, we recommend ibuprofen. So depending on the stem, um, you want to decide whether you want to give topical gel or a tablet. If you give a tablet, make sure you read the stem very carefully to see whether the patient's renal function is it's it's normal, it's okay. Um, but normally for elderly patients, we recommend topical ibuprofen because it's safer. Um, and then remember, if you're giving oral ibuprofen, you always want to give proton pump inhibitor to protect the gastric lining. Um, and for post-operative pain is another thing that you often see in the PSA. Again, you go up the letter. And whilst you're watching the recording, you can go through this step by step to see how um, the letter is built up. Um, and last but not least, fracture. It often comes up. So you might see in the stem that they've already exhausted most oral opioids and the elderly patient is still experiencing pain then you will think about transdermal patches like buprenorphine or fentanyl. And then of course, patient control analgesia would be started by the inpatient pain team or an anesthetics team. So this is just for you to be aware of. Um, we'll go through qu questions if you're unclear at the end of the session. So I'll move on now. Before we move on to the next question, we'll give you a little bit more time for IV fluids. So generally the approach is prescribe two bags of sweets, so like glucose or dextrose, and one bag of salt, so saline. And there's three situations where you need to prescribe fluids. It's not just in elderly care, this would be covered in pediatrics as well. So either the patient is um, has very low blood pressure, like under 90 over, 60 and need resuscitation fluids, um, you need to give a bolus or they need replacement because they had nausea and vomiting, usually sometimes secondary to diabetic ketoacidosis in type 1 diabetics. Or you want to give them maintenance fluids. This is the most common situation where a patient needs to be kneeled by mouth before surgery, or this is an elderly patient who's not really swallowing um, food substance and they're still waiting for speech and language therapy assessment, then you'll want to give them maintenance fluids. So I, I did this from NICE guidelines. You want to give water 25 to 30 milliliters per kilogram per day. 
electrolytes will be one millimoles per kilogram per day. And everybody would need around 50 to 100 grams of glucose. And that would work out 5% of dextrose is 0 0.05. 0 0.05 times 1000 would give you 50 grams. So that would be 50 grams of your daily requirement of glucose in that one liter bag of sweet. So sweet fluid. Okay, I'll give you um, two minutes for this question um, to prescribe some fluids for a 74 year old gentleman. Okay, so time's up. Um, happy to read your answers if you post them in the chat, but we'll go through this step by step. So this is a 74 year old male who was admitted to hospital seven hours after a stroke, has not been eating or drinking um, for the last two days. Um, so already it's hinting that the patient is actually quite dehydrated. Um, he had suffered a stroke um, and he would need some fluid replacement. And before we prescribe fluids or before you become an FY1 or when you're an FY1, always check the patient's electrolytes before you prescribe anything. Um, so this would really guide your management. Um, so even though we said too sweet, one salty, um, it's not as rigid as that every time, even in the PSA. So have a look at that. So for this patient, a sodium um, is 144, so it's sort of like borderline high, even though it's normal. Potassium is within range. Urea is slightly high, so this could be a sign that the patient is actually quite dehydrated because it's slightly higher than the upper limit. The renal function creatinine is okay, is within range. The glucose is a bit high because the norm is 4 to 8, so it's leaning on the high side. Um, there's no evidence of cardiac failure. So this suggests that you can be quite liberal in how much you can give. Um, so if we look at the answer. So um, for the question, it's marked in two, two parts. So the first five marks would be awarded to the optimal drug group choice. The other five marks would be awarded to how fast you're going, what route, and how much. Um, so in this case, if you've picked sodium chloride 0.9% with potassium chloride 0.3% or with potassium chloride of 0.15%, then you will get the full five marks. For the speed, if you're giving 500, then any time between four to six hours would give you five marks. If you're giving more, then you wanna give 1,000 milliliters over eight to 12 hours. 
because you're also replacing so um, potassium, you don't want to go too fast. And this is why the duration is so important this, in this case. Um, and this question, because the patient has slightly raised glucose, so if you pick something like sodium, um, if you picked dextrose and potassium chloride, you might be marked down because you're giving the patient more free water rather than salty water. Um, so hopefully this makes sense. I will move on. So this is, I actually did this question myself um, a few days ago because I want to show you what it's like. So in the prescription, if I go back to the previous slide, you will find this whilst you're doing your 10 mark prescription question. And in the search function, you could write sodium and then you could see a load of fluid options pop out. And you can see 0 0.15 or 0.3% potassium chloride with saline. And then once you've picked a drug, you want to pick how much are you giving. If you type in 500, then it will pop out 500 milliliters, et cetera, 1,000. And then you could pick the time. And they will automatically calculate the infusion rate. And this is how you do the prescribing 10-mark um, question. So I also tried... Um, giving the patient heart mints. And actually I only got six marks. And this is because um, you it does not contain enough potassium for um, this patient um, because the patient is also losing potassium. Um, so I think the drop down works if you sort of have an idea of what fluids you wanna go for already. So if you, I, I don't think if you just press the infusion fluid, I don't think anything would come up unless you type in a letter or a word. Um, but I think my my lovely pharmacist, uh, pharmacist doctor colleagues can correct me on that. Um, but that is usually the case. So this is why I want to show you that. Um, but in this case, if you prescribe Hartman's, you wouldn't get the full 10 marks, basically. And... Um, once you watch the recording, you can pause and read the explanation why from the official paper. So this is a bit of a different question. Again, I'll give you two minutes. It's slightly different to the previous one.
So time's up. Um, so I thank you, Sona, for answering some of the questions. So um, I think the previous practice question, the, the thing that confuses people is it did not really provide the weight of the patient. So people are a bit unsure how much potassium to give. But as Sona said, actually, um, I think if if the potassium is in range, then you can be you don't have to like not give the patient any potassium unless the patient has very high potassium. Um, so Sona is actually saying um, on your ward, you often have pre dexinated bags of saline with so uh, with potassium. And so this is their rationale behind the not eating and drinking for a few days kind of maintenance re regimen. But for this question um, for fluids, it actually provided the weight in this case. So I think this time it might be a little bit clearer how much you need to give from the information that is provided. Um, so yes, uh, Rajika, yes, you you, off, you almost always prescribe based on the weight of the patient. Um, but also read the question because um, sometimes it might be different. But thank you for the question. So this question, the patient also had a stroke. Um, it's a 56 year old man who weighed 80 kilograms. And looking at the electrolytes, the sodium is 139, potassium is in range again, urea is in range. Um, the random finger prick glucose is 6.2. The only difference is this time this patient already had some fluids. So this patient already had two 2,000 liters of sodium chloride with 40 millimoles of potassium chloride over the last two days. Sorry, over the last 24 hours. So what are you going to give then? Um, before we think about the answer, think what is this patient lacking? So if we go to the answer, this time the patient has already received um, 2,000 meters of saline, 40 millimoles of potassium chloride. If you prescribe sodium chloride again, then you're giving the patient too much salt because the daily requirement is actually 80 millimoles of sodium. But every bag of saline actually contains around 135 millimoles of sodium. So you're actually giving them around 200, 260 something sodium over the last 24 hours. So what is the patient lacking? The patient is lacking in glucose. And in terms of the daily requirement of potassium chloride, because the patient weighed 80 kilograms, every day you need one millimole per kilogram. So the patient would need 80 millimoles, eight zero millimoles of potassium chloride. In total, he already had four zero. So he would need an other four zero um, millimoles of potassium chloride. Therefore, the answer for, for uh, this question would be giving the patient one liter of glucose, um, 5%, which gives the total daily requirement of glucose with 0.3% of potassium chloride over any time between 8 to 12 hours. As Sona has um, mentioned, you don't want to give potassium more than 10 millimoles per hour. So hence, um, the duration is also an important marking point. Um, appreciate that this is often very confusing. So we can, I will answer questions at the end of the session. So um, this is a slide that I found uh, from St. George's um, fluids lecture, actually. This sort of explains um, why we're giving the fluids, what we're doing. So saline actually covers most of your sodium chloride, which you'll find in the extracellular compartment. And the glucose would sort of cover the both compartments. And that's why it gives you a lot of free water. Um, and that's why you need to top up your saline with extra things with potassium and other bits. Um, and this is the components of most of your fluids. Um, as a medical student, I always find it's very hard to grasp. But as I think the previous example illustrates really well how much we're giving to the patient by the fluids. So um, this is why Hartman's is wrong in the first question because it only provides five millimoles of potassium, um, whereas the normal patient would often need 40 millimoles in a day. So um, I will move on from now. 
In elderly care medicine, you often see questions um, after prescribing a prescription review, and they often ask which two prescription most likely cause a high potassium. And often there's actually a lot of tricks to get around this question because it's very time consuming. If you use the regular method of looking up every drug, looking up at the side effect. So what we recommend is using the interaction checker on the Medicines Complete website. Um, and we can also use the Appendix 1 interaction, the paper BNF. So I've got this um, here, um, I think for, because I did my exam in UCL and we're allowed to take the paper BNF. As long as you don't mark up anything, you're allowed to bring it in, I think. But check with your administrator. And in the Appendix 1, you would actually see a list of drugs that said, um, which cause high serum potassium, high serum sodium, et cetera. And this would save you like at least one minute. Um, and then it would also contain pages on um, common drugs that cause um, toxic effects to the kidneys and the liver. But however, for qu questions like, oh, which of the two prescription actually most likely cause ankle swelling or dyspepsia? These questions are a little bit difficult with interaction checker because I tried it myself. So it's often good to remember some examples. So for example, ankle swelling, you don't want to give amlodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, which often causes ankle swelling um, with something else. Um, I'm thinking like there are loads of things that would cause ankle swelling. And then for indigestion, you don't want to give steroids and ibuprofen together which would commonly cause GI upset. So these are examples that you want to remember. For um, interactions that are more likely to be life-threatening, you're more likely to find it on the interaction checker. So like bradycardia, hyperkalemia, th this sort of thing would be quite life-threatening. And this is often when you could find the answer very easily with the interaction checker. Um, so yeah, I took some pictures with my iPhone of the pages. And this is why I really recommend befriend your pharmacist and ask for one. It doesn't have to be the most up-to-date BNF. So for example, the one that I used was actually, I think it was from 2021, but I use it this year in 2022. So it's fine. Okay. Right. So um, I think I always forget how to find the interaction checker, but this is your Medicines Complete website. Go to the website. Um, if you can't find interaction, just search for interaction. After you found interaction, click interactions. That's the button in purple. Um, it's, it's blue, but once you hover over the word with your mouse, it's, it turns purple. And then it brings you to search interactions. And you could literally type all the drugs from the question stem and look for the meaningful interaction, and then it will save you like one minute and um, you'll be happy. Okay, so next slide. Yeah, so um, again, there are common questions where they ask you which of the following um, contains a serious dosing error. Sometimes they give you an impossible drug. It has happened before. So this is when you need to look that up, but sometimes they're very nice and they would give you um, common drugs. So I would recommend before you go in, have a brief idea of how how maximum and minimum a, a common drug can go. So like bisoprolol, if they say 200 milli milligrams, then it's obviously something's going on. Or even micrograms, they like to do things like that. They might give you 1.25 micrograms. Um, it looked very normal, but it's actually milligrams as the normal dose. Um, and statin, again, if it's 500 milligrams, then it's very, um, very wrong. Metformin, if they usually starting dose is 500, if they say 2.5 milligrams, you know that something is up. So um, go through when you do past medicine or past test, when you revise your finals for different core conditions, you have the common drugs. So have an idea of how much you're going to give for these drugs and you'll be fine. Um, just a, an overall slide for you to pause when you watch back at the webinar. Um, so for elderly care medicine, we're very concerned about acute confusion. And you often see questions like these in prescription review, like which of the, two, which of the following most likely cause acute confusion? If the patient is on opioids, um, antidepressants together, then you know that something is up. Those would usually be the right answer. And electrolyte imbalance can also be a cause for confusion. So look into the stem. If they give you the blood test result, just look very carefully at what they're saying. I would say before you approach every question, spend at least 
30 to 40 seconds. So five seconds to breathe, five seconds to tell yourself everything will be okay. And 30 seconds to actually read the question, what they're actually hinting at. Dehydration is often a cause for um, confusion. So if the patient is on a whole load of diuretics, um, you want to see whether you want to stop some of them. Renal impairment is a common topic in all elderly care medicine. Um, so see if you need to withheld some drugs um, if the patient's renal function or is having a acute kidney injury. Um, so commonly you would want to stop metformin. Um, another thing that I didn't cover here would be post uh, pre-operative, like what are you, um, if you go on BNF, there is often a lot of rules on what drugs to withheld before a surgery and metformin is often one of them. Liver impairment, again, um, your NSAIDs, your cortical steroids, your rifampicin are something that you might want to stop when the patient is having very high and abnormal liver function test. Um, before I close this topic, because um, on the blueprint, you are, you, you're expected to know what the CYP inhibitors and in inducers do and how they interact with other drugs. Many years ago, when I was revising for my preclin, I, I found this really good infographic um, to remember this. So I always remember that um, for in inhibitors, cement is like cement. So cementidine is cement. So it stops everything. So that's a, a, a memory aid for inhibitor. Um, they aren't going anywhere, as this um, person said. Um, so this sort of helps me to remember the drugs. Common example would be giving a statin and a macrolide together um, because the macrolide is actually stopping the enzyme um, from breaking down drugs. You're increasing the amount of statin in the blood. So that's why the patient would experience muscle pain, tenderness, and dark colored urine. This is a very common question again. So um, I, would, I think you could sort of go through this with um, space repetition and, and sort of uh, pattern recognition with uh, most of the question banks. The other mnemonic would be um, for inducers. There are so many different kinds of mnemonics, but again, this person created another infographic. So inducers, they move fast. So car, carbamazepine is a car that's moving. So it's an inducer. So it actually speeds up the enzyme from breaking uh, for, to break down drugs. So you, you wanna sort of like look into the interactions between the drug that you're thinking about and giving them an inducer at the same time. So, um, Yes, I think before I close elderly care medicine, I want to quickly cover Parkinson's. As an F1, you don't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't start Parkinson's treatment on your own. It will be guided by your senior. But as a medical student and for your finals, it's always good to have an idea. So I, I want, I came up with this because I really like baking. So I often think about levodopa and dopa decarboxylase inhibitor as giving the body the building block for levodopa. So I put, I put in this um, cake making icon here. And then when you have the COMT inhibitor and MAO inhibitor, I think of a Petman, you stop the Petman from breaking down the levodopa, the, the levodopa. So these are the common drugs. And then the third type of drug would be, you're already giving the body a, a baked um, cake. So the body does not have to make their own dopa. So this would usually be your ropinarol. Um, and the reason why I put modified release and immediate release is because I don't know whether you would get questions where the patient is on Parkinson's medication, but you need to put in an NG tube and you often, you don't want to miss the drug at the time critical moment. So only, I think only the immediate release form of Reprineural can be crushed and put into the NG tube for the patient. So this is why I put it here. Um, Mind and Bleep has a really good article on Parkinson's disease. So you could re refer to that or you could refer to your own lecture notes and the BNF um, as a treatment summary. Okay, so um, yes, before I close, um, just a brief, just something that is good to know of before F1 and as a final year, there is a stop, start stop guideline because I think medication review is a huge topic in elderly care medicine. It often comes up in your OSCEs, your SBAs. So um, really good to have a read um, on start stop guide guidelines. What we didn't cover this time is bone health, vitamins and RN, osteoporosis, aspiration pneumonia. Um, we often give colmoxiclef if the patient is not pan allergic, but definitely check. 
And what we didn't cover this time is antiemetics. So cyclosine on dancitrol, metoclopramide, just a brief overview. Cyclosine, um, you can give IV or PO, but IV you run in the risk of causing the feeling of high and withdrawal if you give it IV. Um, and if you give on dancitron, it's very good um, for chemotherapy related nausea and vomiting, but it can cause constipation. I was told this by my palliative care team. I didn't know that. Um, for metoclopramide, again, you want to avoid that in patients who might be very susceptible to um, um, the psychotic effects. And also it could cause delirium and it it's definitely relatively contraindicated in patients with bowel obstruction um, for many reasons. So I think this brings us very nicely to prescribing in PEATS. I'll give it to Aisha. Thanks, Janice. Um, so yeah, we'll go for a few questions uh, related to the paediatric population. This isn't very specific to each topic. It's more generic question because that's what it will be in the PSA. It won't be um, very niche paediatric questions. That's more like in your finals exams. Um, this list here on your slide is just copy and pasted from the blueprint. So remember to refer to that on the PSA. It breaks down kind of topics that they could mention in the PSA. Of course, um, this doesn't cover everything, but it helps you guide your revision. So next slide. Janice, can you change the slide for me? Because I don't have access. Thank you. Okay. Um, so our first question, I'll give you a couple of minutes for each one, um, but we'll get straight to it. So feel free to read this. I'll give you a few minutes to read that. And as you read it, make note of the key things in here, because I'm going to change the slide. Right, and then the next slide. So the question is, um, so you need to write a prescription, one drug that will treat the epiglottitis. So what do you want to give um, this patient? So go ahead and prescribe. This is a hospital chart that you would prescribe a drug for. And I'll give you a few minutes to work out. So Janice, if you could go on to just the next slide, but not the answer. So um, <laughs> if you say so when you are prescribing your drug, remember, you've got to write the drug name, dose, frequency, the route, your initials, the indication, start date and a review date because it's an antibiotic. Um, that's when you are putting the indication in the review date. You don't, need, you don't do that for other drugs. And then you're going to want to. So on the right side, you'll have the times and then you're going to want to put the dose there on how frequent you want it. So we'll got, we've got a few question, um, answers in the chat, which is great to see. And we'll move on to the answer then. So if you type in epiglottitis into the BNF, um, it will um, prompt and show you what type of drugs you can give. Um, and cefotriaxone is the answer for this question. And it is one gram because you base it on the weight. So as someone has mentioned in the chat, 50 milligrams kg every eight to 12 hours. So I've done it as TDS or so every eight hours. Um, and then I've put in the signature, the indication, and I've put 48 hours, but 
you could do 48, 72 hours review. Sometimes you know that, you know, the course treatment is for five or seven days and you can just write that there as well. So that's the answer for that one. So that's just your weighing of um, using the BNF, get used to um, forming a diagnosis and working out what drug treatment you want to give. So we'll move straight on to the next question, which is a calculation. So I'll give you again a few more minutes to read that and then prescribe it. So I'll give you about two minutes to prescribe that, um, work out the answer to that. And feel free to write your answers in the chat. All right, um, if anybody wants to put the answer in the chat, they've worked it out. Give you a few more seconds. Lovely, well done. So next slide will explain the answer. So the answer was 0 0.3 mLs. And this is just the working for those who, um, you know, want to check if their working was correct or if you were struggling with the question. So you have to remember the, um, information in the question actually gave you a lot of what you need to do so you need to times the 300 micrograms by five which gave you 1500 micrograms remember to divide that by a thousand to make it into milligrams because you know that the solution comes as five milligrams per mil and therefore you do a bit of maths so you do 0.1.5 uh, milligrams divided by five mil which gives you um, 0.3 mil so that is your answer. Lovely. So we'll go to the next question. So next calculation question, I'll give you um, two or three more minutes to go and feel free to type your answers also into the chat. So yeah, if you want to start putting your answers into the chat, so we're trying to work out here, how much fluid will we give over 24 hours to this child who weighs 40 kg? And then you want to tell the nurses how to run it. And um, so how many mils will they put on the little machine to run it every hour? So we'll move on to the next page. Lovely. 
So here in the blue box, this is a nice little formula that you don't have to memorize because it's in the BNF. So if you know how to work your BNF, you will be able to find that. Um, so if you forget and this comes up in your exam, um, always refer to the BNF. And so he, this child, he or she weighs 40 kg, so that's four. The first 10 kg will be 100 mils per 10 kg, so that's 1,000 mils. The second 10 kg within the 40 is 50 mils per kg, so that's 50 times by 10, so that's 500 mils. So we've got 1,000 and 500. Then he's still got 20, he or she's got 20 kg left of its weight, and that's 20 mils per kg for anything over. So that all together is 400 mils. So that's 1,000 plus 500 plus 400, which is 1,900 mils over 24 hours. So well done to the guys that got that correct. And then we asked, what was the rate over an hour? So you would do, of course, 1,900 mils divided by 24 and 79 mils. And yes, you can round it up to 80 mils. Well done um lovely so and then we'll move on to our final question of our pediatric section which data interpretation And the options are there on the right with the blue dots next to it, so you can select that one. Um, and feel free to write what you've worked out in the chat. So I can see in the chat someone said C. Princess, if you want to also just mention how you worked out C as well in the chat, where you went in the BNF, what did the BNF say? And I'll give everyone else about 30 more seconds to give their answers. Aisha, there's a quick question about the fluid replacement in the chat. It says, would you influ infuse with normal saline and potassium? It's just normal saline, right, for children? Um, no, so we do um, saline, potassium and glucose for the maintenance. Yeah, so we do 0.9% uh, saline with 10 millimoles of potassium and 5% glucose. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, prescribing fluids is a bit different in kids, but that won't, that shouldn't come up here. PSA. Right, okay, so let's just quickly go over the question and then we'll move on to the answer. So this is a one month old requiring an antibiotic. So it's gentamicin. Gentamicin is one of those that have a narrow, narrow therapeutic range um, and you take the levels and the levels then will guide you on what you will prescribe after the first dose that you prescribe. Lovely, seeing some of the answers in the chat. Great. So you, the doctor, the nurses have taken this, this level and they've taken a trough serum gentamicin. And if you want, if anybody wants to interact in the chat and let me know what trough means, but you have to remember the difference between peak and trough. And this trough level is three milligrams per litre. And I, luckily in the question has um, kindly given you and told you the target is less than two. If the question, for example, didn't tell, tell you the target, the BNF does tell you the target. So get used to looking at your um, drugs, for example, vancomycin or gentamicin, 
reading those um, monitoring sections of the BNF just to get yourself used to how to extract the information. Um, and then here it's saying, so based on the information that you've been given, so you've been told they're on gentamicin, it's prescribed eight milligrams IV, eight hourly, and the trough level is three milligrams per mil. Therefore, what will we now do to this prescription? Will we keep it the same? Will we increase the dose of the gentamicin and keep it as eight hourly? Will we decrease it? Or will we increase the interval? So from three times a day, so eight hourly, will we change to twice a day? So just leave a bigger gap. Um, lovely. So yes, yeah, so Ellen, well done. So you've said if the pre-dose trough concentration is high, the interval between the doses must be increased. And that's a lovely copy and paste from the BNF. So the next slide, actually, I've done that too to explain it. So if you look at the gentamicin monograph on the BNF, you will see in the, within the monitoring, it actually even goes into detail about what you would do in children and in adults. So I've highlighted it exactly there. If the pre-dose trough concentration is high, the interval doses must be increased. That means you're not looking at the dose, you're looking at the interval. So would it be a BD, TDS, QDS. It was already TDS, so we just increased it to twice a day, so 12 hourly, because that was one of the options, and we kept the dose exactly the same. If the peak was higher than the recommended uh, level, you then would change the um, actual dose. Um, yeah, and you have to remember that making sure these drugs are within therapeutic range because they actually can be toxic at um, levels being too high. So someone has said, what does this mean? Is gentamicin too high? Yes. So the level of gentamicin in the blood at that specific time is too high. It should be below two. Um, so yeah, if you have any more questions, feel free. But that is the end of our summary of pediatric questions. Remember, this is not a pediatric exam. It won't be specific on how to treat or diagnose. It will be something like this. So questions that you'd see in adult medicine, but based on the pediatric population. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Um, so before you go, please remember to fill in the feedback form um, and we'll be answering questions as well. We'll be um, sending you the webinar um, after you fill in the form. At the end of the series, which would be around January, we'll then um, pub publicize the webinars. But I think if you want to read it now um, for Christmas, before Christmas, um, if you could fill in the feedback form, it would literally improve our sessions as well because we'll be holding another 10 sessions in the series. Yeah. Guys, thanks so much for your involvement as well. It's nice to see you having a go at the questions because it makes it quite nice for us as well. So mm. well done all of you. So um, the next session would be the 17th of November um, and it will be on adverse drug reaction. Um, adverse drug reaction, sorry, adverse reaction would be your section six of your PSA and we'll be covering um, the most high yield concepts in that session. Um, I can also put up the sign up link for session three in the chat. And also Janice kindly put up the, the timetable at the beginning of the lecture. So when you watch the, the recording back, you can see for the rest of the, the series, the dates and what we're going to cover in each session. Mm, that's right. So I put in the um, sign up link for the third session. Okay, we'll just stay behind for another two minutes just to check if anyone has any questions.
And once once you've done the feedback, guys, you also get a certificate for attendance, which is good. So there's still 29 of you left. Any, any more questions, guys? We're still happy to stay on and answer if you miss. Yeah, if if there's a reason why you can't make it, um, I'm sure we can we can send you the the the, the recordings. Um, it's just good for people to actually make it on the day because it makes it interactive for us as well rather than just recording a, a video. So absolutely, if, if you've got a, a reason you can't make it, then definitely don't worry. Julian's got a question. Could you explain why metaclopramide is contraindicated in bowel obstruction? So I think metaclopramide works by moving the bowel along, right? So if you're obstructed, then that could potentially, if you're causing the constriction in the bowel, you could actually maybe burst i would imagine um, yeah and cause bigger problems for yourself um it's just the way the way it works so we wouldn't use that yeah there's a few drugs that you should avoid in bowel obstruction and that's anything that will get the bowel moving so metoclopramide is a prokinetic erythromycin is a prokinetic you should avoid stimulants as well so senna and bisacodyl you should avoid, avoid um those in bowel obstruction too if, if you're suspecting bowel obstruction then you get straight onto the surgeons to come and review the patient <laughs> yeah but the treatment is not to give prokinetics in bowel obstruction it's purely just drip and suck so do not be giving anything to get the bowel going just let it naturally start going itself and the surgeons will make decisions so any more for any more any questions okay thank you for attending um so mm. I love it's sometimes I used to do this as well, like hang on in case there's more questions so I don't miss, <laughs> miss the answers. <laughs> there's still 18 people, which is cute. Yeah, is there anything you want to ask about the PSA in general or anything you're worried about? And um, we'll also, we'll post the, the, the Q&As in a separate document just in case if any of you miss or are worried about something or want to go back to the question, we'll, we'll post whatever people have asked so that other people can also benefit from the answers. So don't worry too much. Yeah. Um, so Julian is asking for the PSA, are we allowed to move back and forth? Yes. So, um, if you, once we post a first webinar, so Sona has already posted her first webinar, um, you will get to a page where you could see all the questions and you could flag up question where you can go back and review. Um, yes, you're definitely allowed to go back and forth. And we'd kind of recommend it because if you're stuck on a question, just mark it for review and move on because you can, you know, especially the calculation questions because they're, they're two marks each and you can spend a lot of time trying to get one question right and you might even get that wrong anyway. So you just mark it and then keep on going, carry on with the exam and then you can, at any point, you can just review, you can go back to any question that you want. Um, and I've done a little screen share of how to do that on the on the webinar, but just have a little play around on the the PSA exam because the past papers on the PSA are really helpful because you can do all that and you can practice going back and forth on the questions as well. Um, definitely work your way around the platform. I think that's probably... Yep. 
Okay, guys, if there's no more questions, I think we will call it a night. Um, we will have, yeah, yeah, definitely have a look at the practice papers. Um, and then if you've got questions from the practice papers, we, we're going to do a, a Q&A right at the end of the series. We're just going to turn up. And if anyone wants to turn up and ask questions, because it will be a lot closer to your exam, then we can try and go through some of the questions that maybe you don't understand on the exam or anything else that you've got. So just jot things down, but but have a play around the, the platform and do the past papers first. Mm. So if you guys really have a lot of burning questions, um, you can send email to prescribing at mindably.com and the whole team would have a look at your questions. Um, I should have shared this earlier. But... And if there's lots of the same ones, then we'll, mm -hmm. you know, address them all at once. Yeah. And we'll also um, post on Mindably website at the end of the series, like all the webinars embedded with notes and really good Q and A's, we'll put it there for your reference. Okay, I think we'll call it a, so let me stop presenting.